The story the children grew up hearing was that their grandfather, David Anderson Sr., the fourth child from a family of ten children, left his home in Belfast, Ireland to come to America. The census records don't agree on the date of his actual immigration. Some would have him at 19, others a bit older. But according to a passport application he signed in 1923, David Anderson was born January 5, 1867, and sailed from Larne, Antrim County, in 1880. If that document is accurate, then he was only a lad of 13 when he made the voyage. David was good with numbers and worked as a bookkeeper for a variety of industries before securing a position with a flour mill in Edwardsville, Illinois. It was this line of work that would result in a career for himself and future generations. In 1890, he married Lily Harriet Hirsch of St. Louis, Missouri. Together they had five children, two sons, and three daughters. It was the second son, Harold, who would eventually follow in his father's footsteps. Explore new worlds and new ideas through programs like this, made available for everyone through contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. It was the turn of the century and the milling business was one of several industries on the rise. Nordyke and Marmon, one of the country's leading manufacturers of milling equipment and eventually automobiles, needed a skilled person to manage their plant in Noblesville, Indiana. Anderson got the job. For 15 years he stayed with the Noblesville Milling Company, learning the ins and outs of the business. Then a new opportunity presented itself. National Milling Company needed an experienced manager to run its facility in Toledo, Ohio. So, in 1909, David and his family moved north. Within a short period of time, he became president and controlling stockholder. Young Harold began working beside his father as a clerk until he entered the University of Wisconsin with plans to get a degree in agriculture. But his college education was interrupted. With the onset of World War I, Harold joined the war effort by enlisting in the Aviation Corps Flying Service. As a lieutenant and fighter pilot, he instructed other would-be flyers at Ellington Field in Texas. Meanwhile, Harold's father was quickly turning his company into one of the largest soft wheat mills in the country. But profitably managing the business became much more difficult when government subsidies were withdrawn. At the same time, newer mills entered the playing field and sales at National Milling dwindled to one-third capacity. Harold constructed a risky plan to shoot the works and bring the aging mill up to standards. Both he and his father subscribed to the belief that there was value in competition, that competition pushed one to improve that was good for everyone, most importantly, the end user. Together they made the necessary improvements, cut expenses to the bone, and within a few years had the business back in the black. Harold had a vision of creating a family partnership, the emphasis being on family. He truly believed that the mother played a critical role in creating the environment at home that would foster success in business. He saw in Margaret Mylink all the qualities he valued in a wife, mother, and partner. There was one problem. She was Catholic, he was Protestant, Presbyterian to be exact. The Catholic Church frowned heavily upon mixed marriages, but Harold could not give up his faith for her. First, Margaret, believe me, and before God I have threshed the matter out, I cannot become a Catholic. And please, Margaret, do not attribute this. He also knew he could not give her mind. up. To live through life without you would be to live in continual unhappiness, for never have I suffered quite as I have in the past few weeks. I never realized how much I really love you. So he approached so the I dilemma like he would any other challenge and drew up a plan. The idea of proposing a plan that, if carried out, will settle our problem Definitely. They would take one year to determine if their love for each other could override any difficulties that may arise. 
They married in 1920, and it wasn't long before the children started to arrive. In total, there were five sons, John, Tom, Bob, Don, and Dick. Two daughters, Sue and Carol, completed the family. Once a week, we had a conference of what our aims were and how well we were doing it about it. We would suggest to each other what we thought we could see the other could correct, and those meetings were very fruitful. Uh, I think they worked as a team. Mom, Boy, Mom and Dad uh, took parenthood pretty seriously, I can tell you that. They, uh, they did it uh, by the book. Uh, they discussed things regularly, were never, never disagreed in front of us. Uh, always presented a, a united front. And if mom said it was okay, then dad said it was okay. So my parents were very uh, united in every way as parents. There was a division of religion, which I thought was sad. And mom used to state it this way. She said, you know, your father is the one who always has to give. And I'm always the one who has to take. That's hard in a relationship. As I grew into an adult, I realized what she meant by that. And he was a man true to his word. He, he kept his promises to mom. Um, he allowed us to be inundated with Catholic thought. And, and we weren't very ecumenical in that time. Dad was the first man who ever preached from the pulpit of Collingwood Presbyterian. My mother wasn't allowed to go hear him talk. And that angered me. I thought, there's something wrong with us. Why are we so closed? We aren't anymore. The best part for me was to see the unity between mom and dad, despite this one big thing that was difficult. We had a couple of role models that taught you know, how to deal with differences, especially when they're so darn tiny. And he'd always get back to, why do we want to argue about what we disagree on? We agree on everything that's important. Let's get to work. <laughs> What a great philosophy. It's worked for me, I'll tell you. For most of their lives, the family lived on the Anderson Farm, a 110-acre piece of property on South Holland Sylvania Road in Maumee, Ohio. Dad and mother felt that there was a lot of work available on a farm, and I think it was a lifestyle that, that attracted him. Dad was a farmer at heart anyhow, and uh, he always wanted to have a farm. In fact, even before he had this farm, he owned a farm in Grand Rapids and had set up a dairy there. It was one of the first dairies to have a milking parlor where cattle were milked uh, by machine. In view of the public at its peak, uh, about 200 cows were being milked, but a couple of cows were brought in without proper quarantine and they had uh, a disease called contagious abortion or Bangs disease. It went through a good part of the herd and most of them had to be destroyed and that's what led to bringing the dairy over onto this property. Uh, one of the buildings was used for raising chickens too. We had poultry, uh, sold the poultry at a, at a farm store, we sold milk there, we sold apples, farm produce, etc., etc. Uh, the whole idea of having a working farm was part of their their plan for raising us to, to appreciate <laughs> the value of work. There was plenty of work to be done. <laughs> and that was just fine with Harold, whose favorite saying was, work is a blessing. I thought everybody thought work was a blessing. That was such a mantra in our house. It was said so often, I can't remember a time when I didn't hear it. I'm surprised that Mama and Daddy and work is a blessing weren't my first words. <laughs> By far, the biggest customer of National Milling Company was the National Biscuit Company, headquartered in New York City. They were so impressed with the way Dave and Harold had turned the mill around that, sight unseen, they made an attractive offer to buy Dave's stock, with the hope that Harold would stay on as manager. A handshake sealed the deal, reinforcing another belief strongly held by the father-son team. Make your word better than your bond. Dave retired from National Biscuit and Harold ran the company for the next nine years until he felt ready to venture out on his own. 
Harold's relationship with National Biscuit was, simply put, extremely close. Word of his plans to leave this thriving company in the depths of the Depression traveled quickly. Within days, letter after letter arrived in his mail. He and his father had developed such a fine reputation within the milling industry that every one of their business associates regretted Harold's decision to leave. Some people questioned the wisdom of this risky decision, but all in all, they wished him well and trusted in his future success. Mom and I were talking one morning about when, when Dad decided to leave the National Biscuit Company. National Biscuit Company was one great company then, and the business they were in, which is basic food during the Depression, was about as good as it could get, you know, the flour business. She said to me, you have no idea of the shock waves that went through the family when he said he was going to leave that position and go on his own. You know, as probably describes Dad as willingness and ability to take risk as any other one thing that he did. In early 1937, Harold went into partnership with his wife and father to form the Anderson Elevator Company. The site for the elevator would be U.S. Route 20, Conant Street, and the Wabash Railroad tracks in Maumee, Ohio, just southwest of Toledo. His vision was to uh, be able to gather the farmer's grain in, in a pre pretty broad area around Maumee and Toledo and get it into water transportation on the lakes and uh, be able to pay a higher price for the grain and attract a lot of grain to the one location. Construction on the one million capacity concrete elevator commenced in March of 1937. Anderson hired about 40 of his own men, many who were farmhands, to clear the land and get the site ready for the pouring of the concrete. The materials for the elevator were transferred from one of Harold's many projects, a stone quarry he owned not far from the construction site. Part of the plan included the laying of side tracks to connect the Wabash Railroad to the plant, allowing for quicker transfer of grain to rail car and eventually the Maumee River just south of downtown Toledo. The work continued uninterrupted even while the union kept its eye on the progress. In May, the call went out for new employees. Then, in mid-June, with perhaps a month of construction remaining, Harold Anderson overworked and utterly exhausted drove his car into a tree. His condition was serious, both physically and emotionally. What resulted was some 13 months of deep depression, several stays in a psychiatric hospital, and some of the most important lessons he would ever learn in life and in business. He had a, a severe emotional upset that they call depression. He was extremely honest about it. But when they are so afflicted, they're sure they'll never be well again. And he used to say to me, put me away in a state institution and forget me, you and the children are going to starve. But he came through. He shared with me in later years what it was like the first couple places they put him. Uh, he was in a state institution in Marion, Ohio. And uh, he was in this yard and he had these imaginary pains in his shoe. And he complained to one of the guards guards or whatever they call them, they were like guards. And and the guard said, Don't, uh, shut up, you're crazy. Okay, that was a type of treatment that people like that got then. I think as a three-year-old, I thought all families had a father that went away. You know, I had no experience to know that this was something unusual, nor did I understand what depression was. But my mother, was a very tough lady, and she had a lot of concerns. He was emotionless. He didn't love her. He didn't love the children. I didn't know this, of course, as a three-year-old. But she went to her father-in-law and said, I'm getting advice from everyone. What should I do? I'm going to listen to your advice. And he said, get the best doctor you can and take care of him. And she did that. During his hospitalization, the elevator was leased to Continental Grain Export Company. By early 1939, Harold was ready to give his partnership a second try. 
he resumed ownership of the elevator and embarked upon plans for an additional 2 million bushel storage unit. This would connect to the existing structure. The expansion was made possible thanks to the long-term storage contracts he signed with Cargill and the Farm Bureau Co-op. Once the facility was built, he would use his own employees, together with the union men from Continental, to manage the day-to-day -day operations of the elevator. As before, the overall aim was to provide services to farmers at a lower cost than the competition, or, as he often stated, to out-co-op the co-ops. His plan failed once again. It's really interesting to see how lacking he was in talent and experience. We, that's what he really got into in cash grain at the first elevator. Wheat is a living organism, and you've got to know what you're doing to store it. And you need a good organization, you need the right equipment. And he had neither, really. Good aeration, good temperature control, and a management team that can identify problems and keep that wheat from going out of condition, knowing what to do when the temperature starts coming up on it and so forth. His timing was wrong. He thought he could attract grain by truck in the 30s from a broad distance because he could pay more for it due to his transportation advantage by getting the grain onto water. Farmers were still taking their grain to the local country elevators, which were scattered all over the landscape by horse-drawn conveyances and small trucks and tractors and so forth. So they couldn't haul a long distance then. Uh, also, they had very tight relationships with their local country elevator management and who was this big shot that's gonna come in and promise something that they can't get at home. And he was timing us off because there wasn't that much pressure at the country shipping point for service. He also didn't have a marketing plan. He didn't have a communications plan, which he did in spades in the 40s. And then he had the labor problems. That was in the second go around after Continental Grain, which was a union shop, was finished with their lease and dad took over. And he had seven union members who really gave him a tough time and he didn't know how to deal with that effectively either. And he ended up with a significant fight where he lost. The suit was settled with partial back pay going to just a few union workers and an agreement on the part of Anderson that should additional men be needed to run the facility, those who had signed with the union would be called first. No new men were needed because the company was struggling to survive. Nonetheless, 1940 showed a modest return and Harold stayed true to his promise that his employees share in any profits. But the cost of the trial and other factors had taken their toll, and though the Anderson elevator died a second death, Harold's reputation began to grow. Cargill, which had every right to take possession of Anderson's facility, instead offered Harold a 10-year lease on the elevator. That income, combined with farming, quarrying, and a bare-bones budget, was just enough to keep the family afloat. Then, on July 11, 1941, tragedy struck the family. Young Sue was killed in a terrible accident. I was 12 and Sue was 10. And, uh, yeah, we were, we were very close. I, um, and our, our routine that summer would have been to do our chores. We all had a pretty organized work program. And then we had the pool. So we had, most of us would go swimming in the afternoon. After lunch, Sue was skipping through the house and she still had to dust the baseboards in the far side of the house. And the last thing I said to the child was, Sue, don't forget the sewing room. And she said, I won't, Mom. Well, at five o'clock that afternoon, I blew the siren, which meant for the children to come and do whatever chores they had to do and get ready for the evening meal. They all came except Sue. And I said to Carol, where is Sue? She says, I don't know, Mom. She never came to the pool this afternoon. And then I walked into the sewing room and there she was, lying under the table. 
And I said, Sue, it isn't like you to hide from your mother. And I, she didn't budge. And I reached down and took a hold of her, and my arm hit the radiator, and a spark flew off, and I felt it in my hands. I remember I was at the store picking up milk and bread for dinner. I called home to get it straight how many quarts of milk Mom wanted, and Bob answered, and he said, get home right away. And I knew something. He would goof around a lot, but I knew he wasn't goofing around this time. And I pulled up, and he just blurted out, Sue's dead. Man, oh man, it's like somebody hit me with a ton of bricks. Mom never broke down and cried or got hysterical or anything. Carol and I did. Just Mom said, okay, be quiet. It's not going to do you any good. And she said, why don't you go over there and kneel down and say a prayer. She, uh, she really handled it well, I'll tell you. She was an inspiration to me on the way she... But that was a day I'll never forget. Well, I didn't get over that for years, just years. Because he felt himself slipping again into depression, Harold had checked himself into the hospital earlier that month. He was at Clifton Springs when he got the call about Sue. We were all talking about, gosh, how is Dad going to take this? We were very worried about him. And we saw him coming across the yard and we went up to greet him, we ran up to greet him, and he encircled us with his arms and said, well, kids, we have an angel in heaven. And I just remember that, whew, the relief, the relief that he was taking it that way. It was tough. Harold never returned to the psychiatric hospital. Never went back. I, I the doctor that I am not, <laughs> think that it worked like a shock treatment for him. I think he realized how very important he was to his family. Uh, lots of times a death like that, a child's death, separates couples. I saw it drawing mom and dad together, you know, drawing all of us together. Um, it was a watershed moment. When the United States entered the Second World War, Harold's four oldest sons were ready to enlist. The first three boys all earned their wings in the Army Air Corps. John flew P-38s in 50 missions over Europe from bases in Corsica and Italy. Tom graduated tops in his class but remained stateside as an instructor in the advanced program for fighter pilots. Bob trained as a fighter pilot, but the war ended before he could see any action. Don signed up with the Navy and served for two years near the end of the war. Dick milked cows. And I was in the barn doing the morning milking and the phone rang. In those days, long distance, man, that was enough to get you all excited, you know, and not know what to do. And I had three milking machines going. When you got three milking machines going, you are moving. <clears throat> I answer the phone. Hey, Dick, this is John. Oh, what he heard was, yeah, what do you want? <laughs> well, that's what I said when I was so t busy and I was so excited. Well, what he heard was, here I am, the conquering hero coming home. He's been home milking the cows and shoveling the manure. And what he thinks of me coming home is, yeah, what do you want? <laughs> but anyhow, it was a very busy, very busy schedule and the seven days a week, you know, 365 days a year. The dairy kept the family alive through the war years, but in November of 1942, Harold suffered another loss. His father, his mentor, and his first partner passed away at the age of 75. David Anderson Sr. never lived to see his son's dream of a family partnership come true. When the war ended, the country seemed to share a renewed sense of optimism. Harold felt it too. The 1940s had given him time to thoroughly think through his business strategy. With each of his boys home from the service and ready to pitch in where needed, he embarked for a third time upon his unwavering mission to give faster and better service to farmers at a higher price than they were currently receiving. By now, grain storage capacities were totally inadequate for the area. 
Harold saw this as an opportunity to start over by erecting a half million bushel elevator on Illinois Avenue. The new facility would be called the Anderson Truck Terminal. And in 1947, the Anderson Partnership was reborn. The partners were Harold, Margaret, John, Tom, Bob, Don, Dick, and Carol. The first wheat harvest, I'll never forget that morning. As long as I live, there were trucks as far as you could see everywhere. We unloaded 100 trucks an hour that day. And at that time, farmers were waiting at the local country elevators for 24 hours, 48 hours, you know, to get unloaded. And they couldn't pay the prices we were paying because we had the water outlet at that time. For its time, the Anderson Truck Terminal was regarded as one of the most modern facilities in the country. They stopped at a dock first and got their load probed and samples run and then the farmer could see what the grade was and what we were going to pay for that before they even went over the scale. Then they went over the scale and they found out how much their total load was worth before they dumped. And then after they dumped, of course, they were satisfied. This was a deal. If they didn't like it after they went over the scale, they could drive out and take it somewhere else. And so that all helped to build a trust, you know. We had eight straight truck lifts and one semi-lift, and then we fashioned another semi-lift later for ear corn. And they could dump into two separate 1,000 bushel bins, so it was a unique design that worked. We had such an advantage with the freight and with the efficiency of this operation. And with the flow, people just were talking about it. This was the place to come. It was a sensation in, in this industry. We were on five radio stations, five minutes every morning. Those programs were about half philosophy and half prices. Moment for good living in there. And then you'd talk about the family and then what the market is today. His communication system, his, his concept, his timing, and he had a good crew. I mean, all of us were dedicated and we'd picked up some of our farm help. People like Sam Herman were there, you know, just, it was really a dedicated crew. About August, sometime things just slowed way down and John uh, came running out of the office with a fistful of papers. Dick, Dick, look at this. We made $60,000 in the month of July. You know, and that was the total capital cost of that whole complex was $215,000. So you get an idea of what the dollar was worth then and how it felt, because we knew we were taking a huge risk again. Dad had failed twice in the past. Back at it, hammer and tongs, you know. That time it worked. In the next episode of Grain, the company begins to diversify with the warehouse market. A minus is turned into a plus with corn cobs, and the big pour makes national news. Thank you.